Welcome, everybody. I have immediately this thought about when the going gets tough, the tough get going. <coughs> you are the core of the whole audience uh, which we had over two days. Uh, so you are probably the ones who really understand what ERTMS is about. My name is Michel Russen. I am the managing director of the ERTMS users group. I guess that 95% of you know about the ERTMS users group. But for those of you who don't, we are a corporation of railways with large investments in ERTMS. And we have 11 members. And check for yourself whether you already know wh which members I'm going to mention now. It starts in the north with Bananor. Then we have yeah, Sverdekjen is waving uh, all the top. It, that's the right place to be, Sverde. Then uh, we also have Anders Orkerson uh, also over here uh, of one of the other members, which is Travik Verket. You're, you're, you're quite lower, but I think that no Sweden is even higher than Norway. You're from the southern part, okay. Then we have uh, Bane Denmark, Jens, who is going to give a presentation. Uh, uh, then we have the United Kingdom, Andrew, and you saw, well, Nicola, you were not representing Network Rail, but the EIM, but you saw Nicola already. Uh, then we have ProRail. ProRail is, I think Henry couldn't make it. Okay, but, uh, but, uh, but, but that's why, why, why I think also Nicola was there. But ProRail, Infrabel, I have seen Jo de Boscher in the, in the room and there are some others. Ah, Jo is there, yes. Um, Deutsche Bahn, I saw Reiner, I saw Stefan Bode, so that's great. SNCF Rezo, I didn't see Cherry today, but of course we had Mr. Jantin, so what, can we, what could we have expected better than that? Uh, then we have Switzerland. Stefan Schmidt also giving a presentation. Uh, and uh, then we come to the south of Europe and we have Spain, Adif. And uh, I saw uh, uh, Jose today, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that I have seen anybody else from, from Adif. And we have uh, RFI from Italy. And Fabio Senesi from, from, from Italy was here yesterday and he gave already a presentation. So that's about the users group. This session is called Winds of Change. Change. You can wonder why was this title chosen. Probably it's something like, um, I, I, you can see this in the Netherlands, we have this on the beach nowadays, that you, you have these, these carts which, uh, with a big sail. Uh, I think we have built the vehicle, which is called ERTMS, and now I think, uh, uh, the wind is, uh, ta can take it up to make it a, a, a long ride uh, uh, to fulfill its uh, mission uh, to accomplish what we want to achieve. So uh, I think that is also what, we, what would be my observation from the discussions which we have in the ERTMS users group with my members. I think that everybody now says, yes, the specifications for, uh, for uh, uh, ERTMS, they are uh, sufficiently mature. So now we can really roll it out. We have had the first experience with, uh, with all the lines and, and the first projects, but now we are ready for large scale implementation of ERTMS uh, over Europe. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that, uh, that uh, what was uh, expected by the commission, that, uh, that a lot of my members will be uh, working on that. <coughs> Moreover, I think that they see ERTMS not only as an isolated, uh, uh, replacement or renewal part, but they see it as really an element of, uh, of coming to the uh, future railway. And that is also why I think it is very, uh, uh, very interesting that we start, uh, because this is about the future of the railway, that we start with a, with a keynote speech from, uh, from Giorgio Travaini, um, from the Shift Rail Joint Undertaking, who will, who will bring us along and then we will continue with First of all, um, bridging a hurdle which we still have, which, called, which is called testing authorization. Uh, uh, and then the view, the, the, where, what are we doing uh, to make sure that we are going to create this future railway? What are ideas of individual members of the user group about that? But first, Giorgio, the floor is yours. So hello everybody, uh, thank you for the agency for the invitation. 
Thank you, Michelle, for your introduction. I was, uh, let's say, a bit disappointed because I was thinking that the session was called Windows Change because I was here presenting Shift to Rail. But I will try, nevertheless, to bring a little change. And uh, uh, the first change is that my keynote speech, I'm from the digital generation, so my keynote speech still has some presentation. So uh, first of all, if it's going to work, yes. I will not annoy you what it is a shift to rail because I think most of you knows what is shift to rail. Yesterday I heard you had uh, uh, long discussions and presentation about uh, IP2 and the activities of shift to rail. But shift to rail per se, it's already a wind of change. It's already a practical application of this because for the first time we are sitting all together to do research innovation and research innovation that will go into the market. Uh, our aim is really to drive innovation and to drive innovation in a way that is from the inception interoperable. So Shift to Rail, uh, uh, it's a public-private partnership. So it's both the private public sector working together and we have inside all the major stakeholders from the signaling and communication systems. I will start with something that usually I don't start like that. I, I am more a dreamer than, uh, than, than uh, let's say, uh, usual, uh, let's say, technician point of view. But I'm also a doer, and I usually start from the dreaming. And, uh, the people we were discussing with us say, well, pay attention, start to, don't scare too much the people about the next generation and what's coming out next, because uh, we first need to uh, make sure that we have a stable uh, system. And of course, I agree. So that's why I will start to say to you what we are doing and what uh, is the doing now and what we should be doing. And then because also, uh, Henri Cololet from the Commission exhorted us to be bold, so I will also bring you a bit uh, to the dream. So first of all, a bit of the history. So ERTMS has a long history, as you know, and uh, this long history was to arrive to one thing, harmonization. And I think uh, throughout the presentation that today were held, uh, everybody agreed that we are coming to a specification release which is stable and should remain stable. What is changing, and this is in the doing of today, is that in 2016, the sector comes to an agreement about a game changer. And uh, those game changers, well, you know what they are, but all those game changers are handled, the research for making them to happen and making sure that uh, they are reliable from day one when they enter into the system are done in shift to rail in the IP2 also that you have heard uh, yesterday from Claudio Monti. Then, of course, we had uh, the important thing uh, from uh, the European Commission, which is the revised deployment plan to ensure that we have a baseline on which to build all those game changers and that can be applicable when, when uh, in 2022, the agencies have foreseen uh, a new CCS TSI. So we are now in the window of change of the RTMS history, which I will call innovation, we, which is an innovation which is, it is, as I mentioned before, from the inception interoperable. We have together working in shift to rail, all the supplier of the RTMS, we have all the major uh, rail uh, uh, network infrastructure manager and operating company, and what we want to ensure is that the system don't enter into problems uh, when it comes to the market. And of course, what we will have to do is that we will have to maintain the system as well. So for making this happen, this we are still in the doing phase, we need to have a successful program. So to have a successful program, we need to work together. It has been said many times during the presentation today and we need to have proper requirements, proper specifications. We need to work together in the research and initial activities. And especially we need to go up, not only to the paperwork, but we need to test 
prototypes. We need to make sure that what will enter into the market will work and will work across EU countries. So the demonstration is key in Shift to Rail. Another key part is our close work with the agency. So the agency is involved in the Shift to Rail projects, is involved in reviewing uh, the Shift to Rail results uh, aligned with the specification, as in the role of system authority, and uh, uh, of course, for the future integration into the CCS DSI. And then the last point to make a successful program, this is still on the doing phase, it's to have a coordinated deployment. Coordinated deployment, it has been mentioned also this morning, it means investments. So we need uh, to support those deployments to make sure that it happens. And we need as well to ensure proper migration plan because what the, the investments that you have already done cannot be uh, simply scrapped. So all of that has been said already uh, this morning. And uh, of course, we need to have a strategic guidance. And this strategic guidance from the EU level is given by the European Commission. So this is a bit still on how to make it a successful program and to deliver results. So theoretically, I could stop here the presentation but I will not because I want to speak also a bit about the dream. And the dream is what we want to achieve is not simply looking into the technical issues of today, the problem, how we can solve that, this is part of our job, but it's also to look into more into the future. And the future comes always with one thing, the user first. So we need to make sure that the passenger the freight forwarder have what they need and have what they need. So my dream is that whenever you have uh, somebody that want to travel or want to transport goods, it has the service that he expect. It has the service that he expect at the price that is expecting. And uh, all of these it's without any technical knowledge from the user. So it's a seamless, um, say journey for the user. Of course all this will be possible only if behind we have a technical system that works, that is interoperable and that is a system and that is actually achieving the single European railway area. So in the single European railway area you will have trains that uh, will uh, work as convoy trains that will be automated, that will uh, uh, employ at full the network capacity and therefore they can reach what the uh, user wants to have a travel service without interaction, reliable, that is able to provide the services that the customer want at the reasonable or just price. So we have these and therefore we need to have as well a visionary program. So we need to start from the top. And the top is the vision that I just described to you. We have some strategic goal as well, which are the strategic goal of the joint undertaking of the European Union. We have some market needs, which are your needs, of course. And we have the work that we are doing today. So we have also the bottom-up approach also. And with the bottom-up approach, we have the projects that are currently running in shift to rail At the moment, we have more than 50 projects running that need to deliver what? Capabilities. They need to make sure that the system of the future is able to deliver the necessary capabilities that the vision is uh, wanting. Uh, opening up new capabilities, it comes, of course, from new emerging technologies and therefore we should not simply look at what is available today and, or what is available only in the race sector but we should look uh, elsewhere as well what other sectors are doing and what is coming up so we need really to have an open-minded uh, because all the activities that we're doing in shift to rail will, as I said, open up new capabilities. Here you have a list of the capabilities that we have developed all together in the sector. 
the first one that uh, you can read there is uh, uh, automatic train operation, which is also a game changer. You have intelligent train, low-cost railway, you have uh, smart, more value for that, etc. But all this only is possible if, uh, like uh, uh, Henri Cololet said uh, uh, this morning, if we are looking into the future and thinking that actually it's rail that leads the future. So we are the one that will show the way also to other sector and not only waiting for things to arrive to the race sector, we show the way of how things are done. And actually in the race sector, we already show the way a bit with uh, the work uh, that uh, you have been doing all over those uh, past years, for example, about uh, automation. So now automation is a hot topic, but uh, it started also with the rail. So I would like to conclude to say, let's be bold again. Words of, uh, of uh, uh, Henri Cololet, let's think out of the box, but let's also deliver. So I think I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much. You can give it to me. Okay, Michel van Liefering already announced himself yesterday, uh, so he paved the way for himself, uh, and, and who am I to say anything about that? Uh, Michel, you're going to discuss, uh, or you're going to inform us a little bit about uh, how are we going to tackle the difficult issues of getting authorization of vehicles, uh, uh, and also a bit of track sites, uh, I think, but mo mainly vehicles. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. So. Maybe I will not spend time and ask if the UNICIC members are in the room. <laughs> we have less than in uh, the users group, but, <laughs> but a lot of people have spoken today about the industry. So here, uh, you know that UNICIC represents the, the suppliers of ERTMS equipment, and I have the pleasure to, uh, to manage this asso association. So, so today I will, um, it's, it's will be a shock compared to a dream vision because we are back to the reality I think with my <laughs> with the subjects here that it is about compatibility testing and another one about reauthorization uh, and in fact if we we look to the two days we have spent with all of you is that testing uh, was uh, something mentioned a lot of time so it probably means that uh, it is a topic which is not yet solved from a principal point of view and it's still key so <coughs> today I will speak about work in progress, so, and this is why uh, I'm speaking about proposals. So I will address uh, two points, uh, ETCS compatibility testing. So yesterday we had a, a very interesting presentation from uh, Rob Deckman from the users group about compatibility, uh, compatibility uh, checks, I, I would say, and uh, the key word was the difference between compliance and compatibility. So here I will speak about compatibility testing. And the second one is about reauthorization. We, uh, we understood also that uh, uh, still ERTMS, generally speaking, is too expensive and uh, a lot of the cost is about certification, validation, authorization. So any action to reduce uh, cost in, the, in this field is important. So, uh, First point uh, about uh, compatibility uh, testing. So it's clear today that and recognized that even if you have uh, two compliant subsystems, they are not necessarily compatible. It's a matter of fact. And uh, <coughs> so it is recognized, I would say, by, uh, by the industry, here I'm speaking generally, that uh, those kind of tests, compatibility tests, are recommended at least with the current situation of uh, the development of ERTMS. And I would quote three, uh, three points. Uh, so this is reference in the CCS TSI, the last version in chapter six, where the TSI addresses additional tests and compatibility tests. Nothing is really mandatory, but at least this is mentioned. Second point, I would like to remember that three years ago, in fact, the, the suppliers uh, within UNICIC they decided to, uh, to, uh, to agree on the conditions for uh, compatibility tests between themselves. 
And so uh, framework agreement on so-called European lab was uh, signed by all members. And this was including, in fact, standardization of the process for compatibility testing, conditions to do compatibility testing, and also based on the three uh, subsets that at least some of you know very well, uh, the so-called 110 to 112 subsets from UNISIC that allows uh, standardization of remote testing uh, between labs that uh, and so this is to avoid that you have to bring all equipments in the same room. Uh, by the way, a message to, uh, to ERA, PO is probably in the room. We are, <laughs> we are still expecting to have the three subsets in the application guide of, uh, <laughs> of uh, ERTMS specification. And um, <coughs> a very interesting document also uh, is a guideline for CCS authorization on rail freight corridor one that has been issued by, uh, by this group of NSAs. So this is the background. So <coughs> today, in reality, in fact, the already uh, quite a number of member states and countries are deploying ERTMS, ERTMS are in fact uh, imposing or running compatibility tests but in fact, the, the way it is done uh, may vary from one country to another one. So I took some examples, Switzerland, Netherlands, Italy, Spain. I should add also Network Rail. Yesterday, something was said about it also. And so uh, last year, the ERTMS platform board decided to, uh, to set up a working group to dig into this subject in order to, uh, to try to propose uh, an harmonized approach, approach for compatibility testing but in order also to pro propose something which is more efficient and more predictable uh, for the ERTMS approval. And so uh, we started the, uh, this group that I have the pleasure to chair. So <laughs> uh, this group, by the way, uh, brings uh, around the table representatives from all uh, representative organizations, so including the users. This is important. Uh, CER, EPTOLA, ERFA are around the table, EIM, the Commission, ERA, the Users Group, and UNISIC. <coughs> and so we, uh, we started, uh, in fact, to analyze, in fact, real cases, because now we have, uh, we have some experience about uh, this subject. And so we analyzed uh, the return of experience from the stakeholders. They came with a very transparent uh, explanation on why there were some issues on projects and how to correct that. And uh, in fact, one of the key uh, principles, or uh, it's not a discovery, of course, it is the ETCS compatibility is based on not only on the interaction between two products, Trackside and Trainborn, but it is the interaction between operational rules, engineering rules, product-specific technical solutions, because even if the products are fully compliant, they have their own timing, their own processors, uh, the, the, the way their hardware is, uh, is performing, and all those things may have an influence on the compatibility. And so <coughs> it's quite a complex subject because we have to bring everything together to, uh, to check the compatibility. So another point that was uh, clearly noted is that the cooperation between OBU and trackside supply suppliers needs to be facilitated with the involvement of the other parties and basically the customers. And uh, <coughs> one uh, result uh, coming from uh, the meeting we had is that uh, the infrastructure managers have to play a key role in the compatibility approach because at the end of the day, the, the, the IMs they, uh, they define, in fact, the, the use cases, their operational rules. Then you have from that the, uh, <coughs> the track site design, and this will trigger the, the, the functions on board. So the reference of the infrastructure are managed by the infrastructure managers. So this is, a, this is really a key point, because in the process that was built by the, by the suppliers, this was mainly relationships between an onboard supplier and a track site supplier. So, uh, in just a few minutes, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to go into all details of uh, the, the process we, uh, we have done. So, I think there is a point of somewhere here, maybe. Yes. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, as I told you, I will start by the different uh, actors in the process of compatibility testing. So, we have uh, 
I will start by the OBU suppliers that want to, uh, to, uh, to test basically an onboard against uh, trackside implementations. Uh, just a comment that we can consider uh, compatibility test from a product point of view, EC component for example, but also from a subsystem point of view when you have already engineered uh, the, your product within, uh, for example, a rolling stock. And then you have to, to test uh, the train bone against, in fact, representations of, uh, of track sites, the real copy or the copy of a real track site. On one network, you may have even different, cop different uh, representations simply because you may have different engineering. Uh, if I take the case of in the Netherlands, for example, uh, we have three, pro three different uh, implementations on the B2 route on Amsterdam Utrecht uh, on uh, the ASP line. Different engineering rules, for example. So if you want to test the compatibility, this has to be done with the real representation of the, of the track site. And who owns this? Who is able to, to tell where is the representation of the, uh, the, the, the copy of the track site? This is the infra manager. So the process is the following, is that if and when uh, no BU suppliers need to perform compatibility test, he will address the infrastructure manager or more infrastructure managers, depending on the area of use into which he wants to perform compatibility test. And the infra infrastructure managers will tell where are the test facilities where he can perform, in fact, the compatibility test. And then the test will be, of course, <coughs> a range between the OBU suppliers and at the end of the day with the test facility provider. The result of this process will be, will be to deliver a test report, a test compatibility report. And this report is a, something that will be attached to uh, the trainborne equipment in such a way that when you go to the authorize, authorizing process, in fact, the, there is a, a quality of the, of the trainborne equipment. And we know that this specific trainborne equipment is able to run in a specific area of use. And the idea is not to make this process a business. It's not a business. We want to reduce as much as possible testing. It's more a burden than a business. And it means that if we have, on top of that, a proper configuration management, we don't need to repeat test. Because if the network configuration, I mean operational rules, engineering rules, do not change from one line to another, and if the uh, configuration of the onboard is well managed, then there is no necessary need to repeat in compatibility test, and the report remains valid under certain conditions. So it means at the end of the, end of the day, there will be a qualification of all the, uh, the train borns uh, equipments available. They will be attached to, uh, into the authorization process, and this, this will help, in fact, reaching what the, the end goal, which is interoperability and compatibility. <coughs> So again, this is work in progress. We are currently, the group is currently, uh, let's say, uh, detailing this process. What's important is that the framework, so which is, uh, in fact, uh, all this framework, what processes, cost configuration management reporting, will be detailed enough in such a way that all the stakeholders can use the same process. Okay, as the time is running, I have to switch to the next subject. Of course, we will keep you and uh, we keep the sector informed about the progress uh, of, this, uh, of this work. About reauthorization modification, this is something very obvious. Uh, <laughs> sorry if it is maybe a bit uh, too simple, but today the, the motivation about the from the pro of the proposal is that, in fact, today any kind of modification to a subsystem requires uh, recertification, even if we have. Uh, small impact involving a lot of parties, nobody, both ISA, uh, etc., which uh, again cost quite a lot of money and time. So the idea is to, uh, to be able to identify a minor modification from a major modification that will, minor modification that will not request to uh, go again into the, the all this process. 
So we have uh, presented in the in the frame of force railway package workshops uh, some proposals to classify, uh, to to elaborate the conditions, in fact, to to declare modification as minor. So, uh, example here, so a minor modification will not uh, require uh, recertification if it is defined as not having an impact on the basic design characteristics, and there are some definitions for that. What's important is that we propose for the, the products to, uh, to have clear identifiers. And uh, <coughs> this is again about configuration management and uh, to have uh, in the identifier a functional part and a manufacturing part. And uh, a minor modification will be if, the, again, the target function functionality remains unchanged and if the functional part of the identifier has not been modified. So if a, a supplier is modifying an, an equipment for what we call manufacturing reasons, that will and this will be identified by a clear labeling, then it will be considered as a minor modification and we don't have to go again in the full process. So this is translated into uh, a flow chart that is here. I think it's very obvious that something important is that even for a minor modification, even for a minor modification, of course, there should be a check from, from an independent safety assessor to, to verify that, okay, the modification has been properly done, even if it is a manufacturing modification. So I'm uh, concluding, Michel. <laughs> so again, a uh, very short presentation because, uh, but uh, subject which is quite uh, dense and uh, leads needs quite a lot of discussion and work. So proposals are ongoing and uh, the, the goal is to finalize this beginning of next year in order to be able to bring proposals into the revision of the CCS TSI that has to be ready for beginning uh, 19. Um, and of course, so we, uh, we, uh, the group is currently creating all the detailed documents that are necessary. And my last word is that I will repeat that target remains to minimize testing. So what we want to propose is something that at the end of the day will lead to uh, the situation which is here, is that generic test on products, this will, inc it means increasing the pro the at the origin, the quality of the products to minimize not only uh, side test, but also the, the so-called lab test. So thank you very much for uh, for your attention, and I will remain available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. Thank you, Michel. Uh, those of you who have been more in these conferences may have recognized this lower lower picture because it was already there many years ago, and it actually shows that we have a very consistent way of working. Uh, we are still pursuing the same goal, which is, I think, very good. So. Now, having had this hurdle, we are going to give you some more information about uh, 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 how, where we are with the implementation of strategies and, and the thoughts about strategies uh, from uh, some members of the user group. Before giving the floor to Jens Holzmuller from Bahn of Denmark, who's going to say where the Danish program is, uh, just for your uh, to recall, yesterday Sverre Kiana told you about the Norwegian strategy already, and Fabio told you about the Italian strategy. So these two actually could also have fit very well in this uh, program, uh, in this part of the, the program. Uh, but uh, of course, we could not uh, use everything over here, so we, we had to, to borrow something uh, somewhere else. Jens, if you give us some information or, or uh, a good information about where we are in the Danish program, you're much welcome. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Michel, sorry for my voice. It um, broke yesterday uh, for some reason, but um, I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about where are we in Denmark, and um, as um, I'm also going <coughs> to just briefly introduce what is the Danish program. Um, title is full migration, and and that is what we are aiming to do. Um, just a bit of background. Uh, this looks very much like what Sverre presented yesterday. Uh, because Norway and Denmark are essentially very much in the same situation uh, and a similar situation to many infra managers in Europe. 
Uh, we have a network uh, based in quite dated technology. Um, we have to renew the signaling systems at some point in order to sustain a continued service. Um, back in 2008, we built the what we call as a program phase for a renewal, and uh, it was based in a uh, business case, which we did in 2006, for the renewal of, of signaling in Denmark. Um, really, this, this picture is uh, that we, we have to do something, uh, because if, if you look at Denmark, we have a, um, a core corridor um, running from bet between the, the main cities, and if you see a, a major portion of, of this core corridor is, is painted red here. Red means it uh, will have to be renewed before 2024, or we will have difficulties sustaining current traffic. Um, for the renewal, we looked at, at various ways of doing renewal, and conventional renewal obviously was investigated. However, with the backlog we had on renewals, it was barely possible. Um, <coughs> also, uh, a point here is that the benefits associated with modern radio-based signaling are quite uh, appealing, actually. And EATMS is, is a European standard for radio-based signaling for all I care. Well, you could do level one, but really that was not what we were looking for because we were looking for renewal. So what is the Danish signaling program? It is a national deployment of EATMS for the main lines and um, it's a national, uh, well, a, a mass transit deployment of CPTC for the Copenhagen mass transit system. So radio-based signaling, basically. We contracted this in, in end of 11, start 12, to um, major suppliers, uh, East Denmark to Alstom, West Denmark to Thales Stockton. At the time, Thales partnered up with another cont contractor for the installations but today it's Stockton. The onboard for the, all the existing contracted traffic in Denmark was awarded to Alstom, and um, the STM to Siemens. Nokia built the DSMR network. It is in service, but it's been slightly uh, um, uh, extended now to sustain um, ETCS level two. And um, then we had the CBTC system. Obviously, this is a one contractor approach, so it's, it's, it was Siemens who won the contract. We chose baseline tree because we needed basically the features of baseline tree uh, for a conventional railway. Um, there's a number of arguments up here. I'm not going to go a lot into it, but I mean, we do have a lot of level crossing, something like 500 on the network. Uh, we did need something when we deploy on a national scale. We did need a, a concurrent, a, a current level IT security standard, so we couldn't live with offline uh, solutions for key management, for instance. It's simply not bearable. Um, we also have a lot of conventional trains running here, you know, not fixed consist, but, but variable consist trains. So uh, breaking curves uh <coughs> and based in, in, in variable consist, supporting variable consist was necessary. For the S-Band, our requirements weren't really suitable for EATMS. I've heard yesterday presentations from Network Rail suggesting that today they might be mature for this. Fine, but they weren't at 12. So um, this is a CBTC system, and we're quite happy with that. Um, and what is then the status? Well, the status is that we have deployed EATMS on, on two lines by now, the early deployment sections. If we look at the original plans, we should have been in service on these lines but the design uh, took a little longer than planned. Um, the two lines that we have built by now are the early deployment section for the Thales contract in the northern Jutland, and the early deployment section for the Alstom contract um, on Sealand. We have ongoing works and installations on further two lines in Thales territory, and we have uh, the installation almost finalized for the new high-speed line on Sealand, as well as installations ongoing on, on the uh, Alstom installations between Odense and, and, and Svendborg. Uh, quite a lot of installations ongoing, not in service yet. And uh, one of the little details which I will come into more details on, on actually here is, is the fitment of the onboards, because that is currently our biggest challenge. Um, in 2016, we switched the sequence of lines because some of you may know that in the original plans, we were going on the main lines quite fast. And um, this, due to the longer uh, development time 
and, and due to some of the challenges with fitting on boards, this has simply not been feasible. So we shifted the sequence to go to secondary lines first. That was good, because otherwise we would be in even more problems now. Um, apart from the lines fitted, uh, we also have obviously the two TCCs, the two, two new TCCs concentrating all traffic for, for the two contract ar areas. They are fitted, they are in service. Um, and our test lab. <coughs> so, um, currently we're working hard to put the two first lines in service. I know personally that they work because I've been part of the testing program on the lines. We were testing last week on the Alstom line and, and yes, the technical solution works on that line. But I was running in an old uh, diesel train set, uh, which is one of our four test trains. I wasn't running in a commercial train on the line because they're not fitted yet. And this is really at the core of the problem. Um, we have been working hard to absorb the fitment delays for the onboard uh, lately. Um, we have been working with the ministry, we've been working with DSP, the main state operator in Denmark, to try and come up with um, a feasible plan which takes into account the actual fitment time for trains, because it's not the one we contracted with Alstom, apparently. Um, we've done variance analysis, we've tried to build more feasible, more realistic time schedule for the installation, um, and we've looked at how we could increase the robustness of the uh, fitment um, for trains. There will be an update shortly, some of you, um, who are active in the Nordic region may have seen some press releases al already from the ministry and, uh, and uh, also from Bene Denmark, my company, um, because there are news on this. Uh, but essentially, um, this, is, this is a picture of the problem. Now, if you, if you look at this, you will see that um, we have the two early deployment sections here, and this is the fleet which is um, for the west, north, uh, fitted for that and it looks quite feasible. It is fitted in time before the in-service date. For the um, east, it's more difficult because not all trains are actually fitted in time. And if we look at something like the um, something like the rollout one, which is the high-speed line, it is much more difficult. You see, this is the main intercity fleet. Not even one quarter of those trains are fitted in time for that line. So we cannot put it in service at the scheduled time. Even if we complete the installations uh, next month on that line for ETCS, um, we will have to find alternatives. Um, just a brief detour here, because as I mentioned, we are not just building ETCS, we are also building radio-based signaling for the, for the mass transit system in Copenhagen. We put the first, what we call the early deployment line in, in service. Uh, one and a half years ago, we've had teasing issues with the new technology. With the we've we've worked with the supplier Siemens on maturing the the uh, installations on the first line. Um, we are expecting to commission the next line in in uh, next year. In um, and and what we are working on really with the first installations is to get the system up to a level where we believe that we can press the button for repeat on the following lines. We are quite close to that stage now. Um, a picture of this, that is, is what you're seeing here. This is the operational um, punctuality on the line. And as you can see in the initial phases, um, we had quite some large um, deviations due to errors on the CBTC system. And if you look at the, at the recent picture, what you're seeing is actually the CPTC system is, is delivering what we are expecting and deviations in punctuality are not really caused by the CPTC system anymore. So what we're actually seeing is that the CPT system, CTPC system is, is, is making the performance more stable on that line, which is good. That's what we're trying to obtain also with EOTMS. I um, remember Svera commented when he saw this uh, slide the other day, he said, oh, this is bad. Um, this is a common factor also for ETCS, isn't it? I mean, on the onboard, we have radars. They don't necessarily work optimal in the Nordic climate. And uh, he's right. Uh, this is a challenge. This is something we will have to manage. 
we will have to look at maybe alternative sensors, I don't know, maybe different calibration, maybe heating sensors, or maybe a combination of all. This is something we will have to overcome, but it's an example of things we will have to manage when installing new signaling systems with slightly different sensors. So, what are the learnings? The learnings are that um, this is not to plug and play yet. It's, I mean, it's clear that the products are there. We can buy them and we can install them. It takes a little longer than typically planned, um, but it can be done. Uh, it can also be done within the contractual framework that we have, um, but it does require um, quite some work from the integrator side, and we are the integrator. The industry is not the integrator. Um, even if we maybe in some cases expected them to be, they're not as much of an integrator as we would have liked. Um, the design phase has been quite long, especially for our onboard systems. We've seen many versions before we had a stable version. Um, the installation process maturity is, is, is not good enough yet. We will get it there, but it's just a lot of work. Um, we've seen market barriers hamper the installation of onboard products and trains. Train documentation not really being available to the railway undertaking and thus not for us as the ones doing the onboard installation design. Um, and uh, I must say, it's, in my, it's my personal opinion that the current onboard product offers, they're not complete with respect to software management. We, we see contracted versions and, well, those are contracted versions, but you cannot continue running with a 330 product for, for ETCS, for instance. That, that's, that's not feasible. You will have to move at some point, um, and it's not really foreseen. So, um, where do we go from here? I mean, we install these systems, we make them work. Um, we will roll them out in Denmark. Next step, uh, of course, will have to be to upgrade the onboard product to release two, uh, including the technical opinion issues. And the next technical opinion, uh, which will also come out at some point, I assume. Um, then we would have to look at a number of uh, business issues uh, beyond that. The improvement of the current braking curves. In some cases, stopping in stations is very difficult with ETCS. Uh, we cannot use the full platform length uh, with the current braking curves. Um, we will have to implement the, 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 the basic uh, capabilities of, of, of ATO trackside and eventually also on board because we want the operational efficiency of an ATO system. Um, for existing fleet, it's probably more likely that we will be using driver advisory. Um, but we do want to utilize the capacity of the railway, so something like this is needed. And of course, within the time frame of this project, also migration to next generation radio. So um, there's plenty of challenges still. <coughs> With that, thank you. Thank you, thank you Jens. Uh, we have to be honest, you are not the first country uh, to do the Big Bang and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, to, uh, to have finalized it as the first, eh? because we have just heard today again that Luxembourg is already done. Eh? Uh, but of course, it is, I think it is very interesting from, you, from your pr presentation to see that the decision to go for a Big Bang eh? is also what, and Sverre mentioned it yesterday as well, it has some risks uh, and uh, it's a difficult project, but you are a pioneer over there and, and, and I, I think that the, what you're doing over here uh, uh, is very valuable for all the others. Uh, and, and I think uh, um, it's interesting to see how Switzerland actually had a strategy, uh, changed its strategy uh, already 10 years ago, I think, and, and that, caused, uh, th that brought us to the concept of limited supervision but has meanwhile again changed its strategy slightly. And uh, uh, we are very pleased uh, that uh, Stefan is going to, uh, to give some more clarification about that. Can I take that one? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's not really a change. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm happy to present the Swiss way for some minutes. It's not really a change, we just learned. <laughs> And I think the most important part is that every migration situation is different, every country is different. This is, of course, 
because of things like in what state is, are the assets right now, or for example, how far is the capacity need. For example, in Switzerland, we have for long years now uh, 30 trains per, uh, per, per hour is a standard. We produce it with optical signalization, and to make the next step, we need a little bit more things to, to implement just to make such steps. So, find out here. So our strategy was always to get on the long run to cap signaling. Cap signaling, not only because getting rid of the signals, it's mainly because of getting the train online, because in every high automated system with precise control, you need a direct online connection to the things you want to control. So cap signaling was always the best way for us to get to a high automated system. But in the long-term calculation, we found out that, and this is already 10 years ago, you're right, <laughs> that it makes sense for us to make two steps and not one. And these two steps are, for us, for our business case, more economical because it achieved a lot of advantages for us that were very important. So we decided to install limited supervision on the full network, which is done right now. We are now, for the full network, interoperable and to get rid of the Class B systems. And this mainly because it enables us to get a very fast and very cheap process, industrial process, to implement the interoperability. And this enables our users to, today, buy new vehicles with only one cap. And the other point is, of course, that the freedom we have now to go the next steps gives us time, time for improving the systems we use, improving our level two experiences, for example, and we call it consolidation, all that little teething problems I just, just, uh, just talked about to get them done. And our vehicles are about 60% now equipped. The rest will be done beginning 2019. Um, for that, we will have time now to make some clarifications. For example, it was already discussed with FMCS, or a good architecture, updatable, and so on. To clarify that point now, but our, our use are enabled now to choose the time and point when they change. And this is important for them because they can choose the best time for the life cycle of their vehicles to make the change to the fitting. And then, now then, we can focus on Smart Rail 4.0, which is nothing more than you no, it's the game changers, of course, and we have the time to prepare that and to get to an architecture in one step, as we hope, um, that has, let's say, our criteria for a really, really big business case. I will explain that. So today, our status is this one. We have blue means limited supervision, interoperability, and we were very happy that the first vehicles, baseline uh, three vehicles that ran on our network, worked in the first moment. So we saw interoperability directly. And also the second and the third one. <laughs> so it worked very good. And on the other hand, we have, of course, our training um, about level two. We used it mainly because of uh, driving with higher speeds, but also to prepare our own organization to handle that sort of technology, because it's quite different uh, for our staff, for building, maintaining, and everything. Um, to learn how to make a very effective system. Of course, all, we have also some teasing problems. We call it consolidation, just to give two small examples. And this is not about interoperability, it's just normal product improvement and improvement of um, the usage. One example is some DMIs, perhaps, that are not really durable or visible. Of course, we have to change that, and they're a bit expensive right now. I hope it's just for the beginning. Other thing is, of course, we heard it already, there's no chance, really no chance, to exchange a key every three years manually for such a large fleet. So online, online key management is very, very important. But the main point is the last one. It's very important to differ between the TSI, the products, and the life cycle processes we have for um, handling CCS, the CCS architecture as a whole. Because ERTMS is only a small part of CCS, but if you look at the business case, or the migration speed, or the automation grade of everything, every life cycle process, we have to fit the products we use 
about the capabilities beside ERTMS, and we have to fit our own processes to be highly automated. And this is now the big business case for us. Our IUs asking for clarification. We have some large attenders coming in the next decade, and of course they asked, what is now the clear roadmap for FRMCS? They heard, see about two or three one from different sides, so perhaps we can fix that and set that to a clear roadmap in the next time. And of course they want to know because SPB is forced to make the next capacity step to use train and trajectory information, so we have to know the train and um, mobile localization. And of course um, we have to fix the problem that many vehicle architectures are let's say a little bit historical, a lot of legacies in it, and we need a normal architecture qu quality with updatability, maintainability, sustainability, and especially exchangeability. We often look a little bit jealous to other sectors like avionics or automotive. If you look at avionics, the IMA standard, that you can exchange spare parts between safe systems of different vendors. We have incremental safety cases and all that things, embedded cloud with zero fear levels. It's very, very uh, advanced. Or look at the automotive sector with Autosar, 200 companies, a big B2B system working together, very efficient. So we hope that we will succeed until we start our large tenders to, let's say, work together with the industry to find a more modular, open, and for example, concerning the life cycle process, handleable architecture. So what we do now, we are in, we've done a preliminary study and now wrote a functional concept about an architecture which represents for us the optimal future, the long-term perspective. It will always be compliant to TSI to say that in the beginning, of course, but we try to do everything we can to clean up and to get the maximum performance with the lowest cost. It's a program of the Swiss railway sector and also some international railways are working with us. What we do there in terms of cleaning up, of course, is trying to get down the number of assets at the bottom from 100 to 30 percent. That means digitalization means only that things you need for driving a train should be at the track. Because, because everything you have at the track, you need 20 times more <clears throat> then you have it in the train. It's a very simple calculation. That means you only need point machines and crossings, and perhaps a little bit more. This is a cost effect of about 200 to 300 million cost reduction per year. Another point is, of course, just three architectural layers. That means we push every business intelligence and logic up to the traffic management level, and we have only a very, very slim ZF4 layer in the middle, in the interlocking. And this cleaning up, again, reduces a lot of cost in the support and in the full life cycle of our CCS. The new type of interlocking will enable us to, um, let's say, migrate very fast, our target. Well, all the feasibility studies are running now, so we see <laughs> where we succeed, but the concept was already um, reviewed by some experts, and what we feel is that it will be possible to exchange about 40 to 50 interlockings per year. We can say one per week. If this really works, and this is just done by some special techniques in the wayside object and in the interlocking, this would allow us to install cap signaling very, very fast, and this is our target. But we have to check that. We are in the middle of feasibility studies, and as you know, we see it at the end, of course. <laughs> it's always, a, let's say, a, it's a journey. But the concept by now, never, nobody found bug by now, so we are hopefully uh, to, to get the proofs of co uh, concept running up to 2020. And the last part, of course, uh, you see it at the bottom, more mobile assets and less fixed assets. Safe mobile localization is a real, real, business case is a killer application because you can combine a lot of things on one platform. For example, automate the field force management, the field processes, 
localize track worker safety, localize train ends for as a level three backup, and so on. So safe, uh, <coughs> safe mo uh, mobile localization will be one of the most important things we try to achieve. And that we don't only think about satellites. We think about, of course, like it's done in military area or in avionic area, good sensor fusion systems with inertia technologies and other things that give you a CO4 level and a high precision. This is the concept. We are working on that. And everybody is invited <laughs> to discuss it with us. We will publish it in, in uh, let's say, beginning of uh, 2018. It will be an open discussion. We will uh, publish our findings. And cooperation is welcome. Thank you, Stefan. So the nice thing about your strategy is that you actually made sure that ERTMS trains can already run in Switzerland, huh? and, and you take your time uh, to, uh, to, to reap the full benefits of uh, ERTMS, uh, but not only ERTMS, also a couple of other things. This is also the theme uh, which will be discussed by our final uh, speaker for today, Andrew. Uh, uh, because the ideas which, which uh, uh, Stefan explained, uh, I think, are very much in line with the ideas uh, of the United Kingdom. Uh, but I'm happy uh, to hear it from you, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you for letting me share some thoughts with you today. Um, this is from thoughts from within Network Rail and also within some of the discussions we've been having with the RTMS users group, including Stefan. So you'll see a lot of similarities here, but uh, hopefully we'll see we're ending up at the same results. Um, what we have been doing is considering some of the challenges that's facing our customers. Uh, this is a typical scene, and someone said, mentioned about getting out of a comfort zone. That's not a comfort zone. That happens every day uh, in the UK. At the moment, we have about 150,000 people standing per day on their way into London. We are obviously trying to address this with some of the work that's been done by uh, John with Thameslink and also the Crossrail. But this is, a, and this is a normal day. You'll also see, and again, this has been mentioned by uh, a few other people, this is the state of our asset. And I think actually ours is older than yours, Fed. So um, there we go. That's, the, that's not a museum. That's an operational railway. Uh, and we have a major challenge in trying to renew this, uh, this, uh, le these legacy uh, assets. So effectively, uh, we got, we got a number of challenges for, in that the railways industry has also got to um, face. Um, uh, that's our growth rate. I say um, passenger numbers have doubled since 1995, <coughs> and we were predicting a billion more journeys per year by the mid-2030s. But you'll see it's not just London. Uh, other places on the network are also full to capacity. And it, what's really interesting is the number of incidents that uh, we're having on the railway, even with those old assets, is reducing. But you'll see that the actual delay minutes are going up. This shows you that our, ne our network is at full capacity, and there's not really much more we can do with it without some form of technology change. But there are challenges we also need to consider. Uh, the transport mode challenges have been mentioned today, uh, earlier on. Uh, we have car sharing going on. We have autonomous vehicles, road trains, budget airlines, and even Hyperloop's been mentioned in this particular activity. These are all challenges facing us as a railway sector. And one of the issues is the cost to sustain and enhance our railway against these competitive modes isn't looking extremely favourable in the longer term. So, what's, what are our problems then? Well, we come back to legacy. Uh, we have a significant legacy challenge. You've seen ours and Spheres and, and Denmark have also highlighted theirs. And one of the issues is that uh, the legacy systems actually introduce uh, significant complexity into our network. The interfaces and the migration considerations when you try and build it into a common system gives us a major challenge. This complexity adds to cost. This cost then means you have to have a long life cycle to consider in terms of your payback. Hey, I've got a legacy issue again. So you've got this sort of, this sort of uh, loop here, where you, a perpetuating circle, where you, if you can't break out of it, uh, then you're always, always going to have these high costs. Is there a way that we can break these, uh, the, these competitive, uh, this uh, legacy system? Competitive transport modes and some of these new startups have no legacy challenge and have designed them out already. 
So we thought, well, what would it look like if the CCS system, not just ETCS, ETCS system, a uh, CCS system look like without looking at uh, legacy considerations? Is there another way we can look at the problem that's facing us? Can we design a migration path without legacy considerations? And some of that I think is what we've been touching on with Switzerland. <laughs> so what can we do to address this challenge? Well, with ETCS, and sig consider ETCS and signaling as a single system. The signaling, sig si the signaling principles uh, can, be, can be simplified. And this was mentioned yesterday in terms of the Italians showing already that they can get benefits from considering um, class A only activities. If we can uh, simplify our signaling principles, can we get um, them harmonized across the member states? I'm not saying we can, but if we possibly could from a class A system, why would a train traveling through a class A only system and say Great Britain be any different from the, from the a train traveling in class A system only through France, Germany, and anywhere else. So can we actually get, get that, um, uh, so rather than sort of look at it from a, from a legacy point of view, just look at it, what does a class A look like? If we can get consistent signaling principles, could we end up with harmonized rules? Uh, and we know there's lots of work being done on the corridors on this. Um, fortunately, we're not in the corridors at the moment. Um, but can we get harmonized signaling principles and signaling operating rules? Mainly around degraded modes. Yeah? If, if the system doesn't work, and we've heard it's very high reliability, and, and we're aiming for high reliability, isn't it right that we actually can consider across the, uh, the, the member states if it's possible to have consistent operating rules to get out of those very, very rare circumstances? And if we can do that, perhaps we can go to a consistent system architecture, and Stefan sort of touched upon that earlier. And therefore, the system interfaces can be defined, such as already been sort of looked at in relation to the U-Links project. So what we're looking at is if we could get a harmonized approach between the member states, the system development costs could be considerably reduced. And also there would be investment opportunities for our suppliers and also new suppliers because of the greater market size that's available through having a, a, a completely harmonized signaling approach. <clears throat> and that would allow people to invest. And what's really important here is not necessarily the technology itself. Uh, it's been mentioned previously as well. Data. It's all about data and making sure you can manipulate your data to actually get the opportunity. And one of our biggest problems, and I think uh, I, I'm talking for most infrastructure managers here, I should think, is that trying to get a legacy data is an absolute nightmare. If we can start afresh from, from saying we don't have to worry about legacy data, if we start from the beginning, then isn't that a brave new world to be in? And then we can therefore get automated design tools and assurance tools that could work a lot quicker and, and, and it changes the whole way you look at the model, which I'll come on to in a moment. And you can, and you can then get harmonized system platforms uh, similar to uh, what we've been discussing earlier. So the above opportunities, you open the door thinking these can, can lead to significant reductions in infrastructure cost. And Stefan mentioned that within, within the Swiss model, they're looking at reductions from 100% down to 30%. If I just give you some understanding of, of some of the analysis that we've carried out within Network Rail, which is very, very high level, but if you took, took it as a total system, not just the infrastructure manager, but as a total rail system, <clears throat> at the moment, I think it's fair to say that our asset life cycle of inf infrastructure is about 35 years. At the moment, we are struggling with the funding we have to sustain our network at those levels. So if we were going to convert it to a completely ETCS railway and make it recognising that as a, as a total system level, we'd have to fit trains, update some of our core systems and get some of these data processes in place, that would probably take us about eight years worth of funding which would go into the conventional signaling system. Therefore, if we wanted to get back to levels of um, uh, 35 years, we would have to get efficiencies of around about 50% just to stand still. That's the size of the change in terms of, of if you take it as a total system. If you want to get down to some of the competitor life cycles, so this say 15 years, we're going to have to get down to figures of about 20 to 30% in terms of the efficiencies. So effectively, we have a challenge, uh, but it really does produce a completely different way of looking at the railway. And this little diagram here tries to explain what we, what we achieve here. So at the top, top here, 
we're looking at, this is the high, so if you actually took a period of time, this is time and this is cost. If you took a period of time, you can see that you take a long time and you can get a high expenditure uh, for a conventional renewal. Because of the cost and complexity, nobody really wants to change it for the next 35 years. It's basically now, oops, I've done that wrong. Um, now basically, you're locked into whatever the outputs are for the next 35 to 40 years. It's not very, very customer focused. If you consider another way of looking at it, which is to spend a lot of money on the core systems and development up front, and then start fitting um, uh, some of your infrastructure, uh, such as train fitment, funded by some of the savings that you're getting, and you can put some reduced cost of ETCS signaling in, you can get to the same point on the same piece of a line uh, and you've had a, you've had a significant change in your, your, your uh, technology. And then, then onwards, you've got a shorter life cycle. And therefore, you can start changing the outputs and meeting the, meeting the uh, requirements of our customers in terms of uh, capability and meeting some of those challenges that we have on a, on, a, on a regular basis. So you can see there that there is a different approach and it, and it really does change getting us out of our comfort zone in terms of is this, the, is, this, is this a different way to work at it rather than just saying we're going to accept typical life cycles of about 35 to 40 years. However, all trains need to be fitted and certainly certain, certain countries, Switzerland in particular, have got an advantage of over there. But we believe that uh, you know, with significant reduction in the infrastructure costs, it could allow railway undertakings to be compensated, uh, but it obviously has some legal and commercial challenges. The high cost of train fitment has been mentioned many a time. It is high, but if you have a simplified and harmonised infrastructure, um, why can't you then reduce some of the functionality of the trains in the long-term future and get those costs down too? And harmonisation and, sim and simplification of the signalling principles uh, would require some key challenges amongst the infrastructure managers and, and, and uh, railway undertakings to agree key elements like RAMS targets, uh, degraded mode operations and system architecture including uh, the functional requirements from system integrity levels. But if the challenge is there, and, and uh, I think there are some challenges, then, then maybe we're already on the burning platform and we should be looking at this much more seriously. So just a different, uh, different, a different model. So as you can see, I have the current uh, arrangements there or, and, uh, and, uh, uh, compared to where we believe we can get to uh, with a digital railway transformation. With, with, which is, will sustain our network into the future and allow our customer commitments and, uh, and growth to be achieved. So what we're saying is ETCS, I believe, is the foundation to a new way of look, working. Um, and uh, it's not just ETCS, though, because we, ETCS is the kernel that uh, we believe that you have to consider all the other areas for the CCS system, uh, which, are, which are identified there. And what we're trying to do is look at, say, once you have a digital platform, what are the capabilities that you can work around? So that the digital railway program isn't just about ETCS. It is also looking at bringing up the capabilities elsewhere within the network. And what, we've, what we have actually built ourselves now is a, an enterprise architecture model of our railway. And we can now understand what the impact of some of these changes will be on our customers uh, and, uh, and ourselves. So... The benefits of digital railway will we'll impact the, uh, the business um, and we can get some direct benefits to the business, which is shown in the dark blue there, uh, which uh, cost efficiencies, better performance and improved safety. And we can get some direct benefits to society, improved environmental outcomes, as, as mentioned this morning, increased economic growth and improved passenger experience. And that's just our own capacity. So in conclusion, there's probably five, point, five takeaways really. Uh, we are facing, railways are facing a number of uh, challenges ourselves as capacity and increased competition and, and, and sustainability of existing CCS systems. A migration approach that facilitates migrations from today's legacy systems but also allows simplified and harmonised signalling principles and operate are, is possible. And ETCS can be the foundation of that. Uh, and we can also look at a uh, harmonised approach to provide economy of scales uh, across Europe, if that's possible. Uh, we, were, we, we were quite capable to do it within the UK, and I believe that uh, Stefan would say, well, we can do it in Switzerland too. But if we can get a com combination of, of countries to, to look at this, I believe that the economies of scale are much bigger, 
and therefore for the, for the supplier's perspective, um, much more um, a better business case for investing in these new, new, new types of working. And with the foundations uh, through ETCS, the challenge is sufficient to provide, are the challenges sufficient now for us to actually have this impetus to move to a different way of, of looking at the, the way we migrate away from having the legacy systems of our constraint and looking at really uh, just going for the class A systems. So my parting shot really is that the rail industry is facing its own challenges and from market disruptors. Is ETCS, through class A only, the disruptive technology to keep rail competitive? That's a question I think we, which is probably uh, one I think we might be worth discussing. So thank you. And just to make the circle a bit round, uh, I, Andrew, I think that uh, what you showed of, of uh, what you are aiming at as Network Grill is exactly the reason why Network Grill is one of the founding members of, uh, of Shift to Rail, uh, and that you're doing a lot of those things uh, in the field of Shift to Rail. That's when we actually end with where we also started. Uh, <coughs> Okay, there are also questions uh, coming from outside, uh, and probably you also have questions. You can have two seconds to think about your questions, because I am going to ask one question first to Stefan Schmid. Uh, Stefan, I heard a lot of people uh, today, uh, starting with Sverre Kiena, talking about EU links. Uh, you didn't mention it, but could you say something about what, how SBB is looking towards uh, EU links in this concept of smart rail? Yes, sure. EU links is very important. Well, let's say working on architecture on the CCS area is very, very important because, as Andrew already, already said, we have to harmonize our requirements concerning this architecture, and EU links made a very large step there. We are part of the party there, and we have to use that work, but it's not finished. We have to do more and to work on that. And it fits perfectly into smart rail. Okay, good. Now you had your time to think about a question. Okay. Um, let me see what I see over here. There's a question to Michelle. It's always about testing. I don't know why you all have so many questions about testing. You mentioned the test facilities providers. Can you clarify who are these providers? Are they really independent? This is accredited. Uh, it, it, I, I, I'm not sure that independent and accredited is the same thing, but maybe you answer that question because it was addressed to you. Thank you, Michel. So <laughs> I'm not sure I uh, should have accepted to be the nominated volunteer <laughs> for the stakeholder, stakeholder uh, <laughs> test and validation subgroup. <laughs> Okay, to be serious, so uh, yes, test facility providers, uh, in fact, uh, I have not uh, developed uh, this, uh, this topic, but uh, on the, the picture I have, I, have, uh, I have presented, this is open, because in fact, uh, most of the, of the time, effectively, the test facility provider will be the track, the, the track site supplier himself. But in fact, the process is the following, is that what we expect is that when the IM is ordering the, uh, uh, the, track, the track site uh, products and engineering to the suppliers that he will order at the same time, maybe the test, uh, a test bench, but eventually it is and or the service for the, 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 the test facility. And so we, we, we have opened the possibility to any kind of party. So it can be uh, a third party which is subcontra subcontracted by the IM that will provide the test facility. But there is one very, very key condition is that the, the test facility will implement a copy of the real track site. This is key. If not, you, we do not perform real compa compatibility test. So, so in fact, uh, <coughs> yesterday we have the inter intervention of SEDEX, for example. If ADIF, for example, subcontract the activity to SEDEX and SEDEX has got the real uh, engineering uh, of the real track site, fine. 
then he is a test facility provider and Adif will mention to the OBU supplier, please go and connect your uh, OBU to, uh, to this lab. And we are not speaking about independent or, uh, or accredited. These are words that are used for the labs related to passing subset 76 at component level. Okay. For compatibility tests, the key word is that this facility, the test facility provider needs to get the real uh, track site copy. This is the key. Okay. One, one little thing which may be confusing for people, you talked about copies of the track site, but I, I guess that you mean that a laboratory has all the elements of a certain network which need to be checked, but it's not that you have all the tracks over there in, in the laboratory. No, no, effectively, but uh, okay, uh, I think yesterday we had the inter intervention of Hans Peter in Switzerland. This process is very well developed in, in Switzerland, for example, where in fact the, the, the test facility includes the interlocking, the real interlocking, the real RBC, so you, and, and of course then uh, the real engineering, okay. This is key to have a, a successful co compatibility check. And for me, this is the key point. And it's not the, the independent or, uh, okay. or accredited. Okay. Of course, everything is run under a quality management process. Uh, yeah. Most of uh, them are ISO 9001. Uh, or things like yes. that. And you didn't explain the whole uh, picture which you had, which was the difficult one, but that is homework, I think, for everybody eh, that at home they can study again your presentation to look uh, on how the flow charge, etc. is. Of so course. there's work for you to do. And, and, and now, that was a question coming from outside, and I see that, Peter Wilms, that you now have a question or a remark. No, but you, you will get a microphone. Uh, please. I don't think that people can completely hear you. Please take a microphone. And people on the web will not get it. That is even more important because that may be a larger audience. Hello. Test. 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 Yeah. Now, now it's working. Um, now, I'm working within the Dutch ERTMS program on the upgrade to baseline 3 for 350 locomotives. And to be honest, I was shocked by the Danish story. Because if we have to expect this kind of results, um, what, 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 can we, what shall we organize to prevent this? So I'm really wondering what, what Michel can help us from the industry how to prevent this. <laughs> because they have to deliver. It's not the owners, it's not the ministry, it remains the industry. Suppliers. Um, so Michel, the question is not for yet, it's for you. No, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, uh, okay, uh, the, the message is, uh, is, uh, is okay, I, I think, the only thing I can do is to pass the message to my members. This is, uh, this is my point, because uh, UNICIC as an association is uh, not producing equipment, uh, uh, is not running projects and tenders. But okay, they are uh, here uh, members representative in the room, and effectively uh, the message is for them. But to me also, I had the, the feeling that this was a nice demonstration of what was discussed earlier, and, and pl the plant from Carol you have to sit together, you have to work together, and you really have to have an open agenda, especially when you have such difficult projects which we have now. And, and sometimes contracts are really a bit complicated in those things. I know it's not your fault, so uh, it's, it's not addressed to you, but... Uh, I, I, I think, uh, to, to come back on the speech of this morning, this is the fault of nobody, okay? Effect okay. You can always uh, say point your finger on somebody, but teamwork was a key word uh, this morning. You mentioned also the, uh, something relevant for me is that we speak a lot about the CCS subsystem, but we have the rolling stock one. So we spoke a lot about interfaces, but there are two sides of the interface. And so when we speak about standardization of the CCS subsystem, let's speak also about the standardization of the rolling stock, because we are then facing difficulties for the integration. So you, we have to think both sides. 
So again, it's not a, it's a signaling people with the rolling stock people. They need to get the proper documentation to integrate uh, ETCF. If not, it takes time. It's not working, etc. So, you know, uh, it's a complex system, especially when it goes to the details of implementation, uh, I think. And, uh, mm. And of course, the, sometimes the contractual uh, clauses do not help. <laughs> I agree also from my past experience. So uh, let's team together to solve the problems. Let's, uh, Jens, would you like to add something to that or is it perfect? Well, not, not everything is perfect. I have understood that. No, obviously not everything is perfect. We wouldn't be where we are now in the Danish program if everything worked as contracted. Mm. But... Um, I think it's a fair point that Michelle mentioned that uh, in a brownfield project where we are installing in, in five, six, seven hundred vehicles um, of ages varying between 10, 15 and, and maybe 30, 40 years of age, uh, it's, it, it shouldn't be a big surprise that, that some documentation is, is less than ideal. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise to us as an infra manager working together with the railway undertakings, but I guess it should, in, in my view, it, it should also not be a big surprise for a one of your members, Michelle. <coughs> and uh, maybe there's been more surprises than, than we could foresee. Okay, I would like to, to deal with another question which came in from outside. And I think that's a question for you, uh, Giorgio, or, or, or maybe in the end it, it, we have to, to pass it on to Pio. Uh, but the question is, shift rail not being a European standardization organization, what is the applicability of specifications developed by them compared to the San Sanelec Etsy? Okay, so I think this is a question for me. So uh, shift rail is not a standardization organization. This is, uh, I think, a clear answer to the question. But uh, the work that we're doing in shift rail through uh, our members and also part of the work is also done by non-members, are all, uh, uh, let's say, research results which will feed into standardization and regulations. And uh, uh, therefore, what we are uh, setting up, and we have already set up, are close uh, relations with the respective organization. I mentioned before with the agency, we're closely working even at project level to ensure that there is a clear path from successful results to uh, regulations. And uh, actually we're doing a bit of the same with uh, the standardization organization, Sensenelec Etsy, uh, to ensure that uh, in their planning of uh, updates of standards, they take into account also the results of shift to rate. And all in addition all of that, uh, we are coordinating together with the European Commission in a discussion platform <coughs> which is called the uh, RASCOP, uh, to ensure that also, well, at European level, but then also at international level, uh, there is no duplication or no uh, standards that contradict each other. Okay, um, just to make the metaphor, you put the ball in front of the goal and you leave it to others to kick it in. Well. And uh, of course, so who is presented in these standardization and uh, uh, regulation bodies in the working group? At the end, more or less the same actors that also are involved uh, in the research activities of shift to race. So in any case, there is a continuation. It's not just giving the ball. But what is important at now, at the very beginning, and this is what we are uh, <coughs> finalizing at the moment, to provide uh, to those organizations our roadmap so that they can foresee in their implementation plan for future activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, also our aim is to go fast into the market, so not to have, uh, let's say, artificial market barriers uh, coming from standards or regulation that are not adequate for uh, having uh, better services at the end, as I said, to the final customer. Okay, thank you. I think, ah, Ralph. You have a question or a remark. Thank you, Ralf Müller, Tignetz. Michel, I would like to come back to this uh, uh, frequently discussed chart uh, you have shown about the testing, compatibility testing. 
when we have learned now with a lot of presentations that the conformity, uh, demonstration of conformity is not sufficient, but uh, the final proof of uh, compatibility is what you presented, the necessity to have a con compatibility testing so that it finally works in the field. Then I imagine some, of, some colleagues who may see your, your chart would ask, uh, well, actually then tell me, what is the added value of the stakeholders involved in the conformity test, in the conformity demonstration? Is there any added value or are those stakeholders you put on your chart sufficient? This is the last question we deal with about testing today, uh, by the way, eh, because uh, it's all about testing. Uh, sorry, Hans-Peter. Uh, or would you like to add to that question before Michel gives an answer? Because, uh, and Hans Peter has for sure an answer on this one, <laughs> because we had we had the return of experience from uh, Hans Peter uh, in the working group. So, <laughs> but uh, I have also a personal opinion. Uh, in no fact, conformity testing is more today. If we speak about passing subset 76, this is more a quality check, and because in fact you 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 test your equipment on one configuration, and then that's it. Uh, and with the, the maturity of equipments, in fact, the, the conformity tests, they do not reveal any more necessarily, uh, <coughs> let's say, important uh, problems. So we, you could, we could question the, the added value of doing that, because at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the suppliers to deliver an equipment which has passed a quality check. But okay, it is like that for the moment in, in the TSI, and, uh, and okay, probably during maybe a certain time, we need to keep on until when the suppliers have really demonstrated that uh, the quality of the initial product is, uh, is good enough. So we should now focus more on the compatibility test, and then again, there will be a ma maturity phase, and the goal is at the end of the day to also skip the, <laughs> the compatibility test. But this goes through some elements that have been presented by the, by the people that are here around the table. So more standardization of uh, also operational rules, etc. So if we move to the, uh, the digital railways that you represented uh, from Network Rail and, and, and the Swiss Railways, maybe we will get to this also. Then we can remove also the compatibility test. Let's give the final word about this to Hans-Peter then. Michel, thanks. It was not planned that I'm coming back to this uh, issue testing, but uh, I heard this question, what is the added value? Remember, yesterday, the independent labs were presenting and saying, we need the integration testing. We need this lab-based integration testing. Why? All that what is done based on subset 76 has demonstrated so far, it is not sufficient. Karel said today, we have problems to solve, not just to point out, we have to solve them. I'm now waiting 10 years that we solve this issue. 10 years later, they are coming and telling us, yes, we need integration testing. This is the key point. And if we are not there willing now also to change that, and let me say, this is also a change on the European legislation. Unfortunately, it is said that after the authorization, we should then maybe do tests on the track or in lab to demonstrate that we are fit to get a track and train. This is completely strange and stupid, sorry. We authorize the vehicles when they are ready and finished and can run on a dedicated track all over Europe. But this is only achievable when we check them in the lab with the integration testing. This is a fact. So please solve this problem from basic and not again with shifting the problem away and we talk in 10 years again and it's not solved. <laughs> okay, as I said, we will stop the discussion, but I, my, my last remark on this, I have the feeling that we are working quite well, also the agency uh, and the suppliers and, and, and the railways now together to, to make this work. So uh, I think we're on the good way, trying to solve the problems and not mentioning or uh, raising new ones. I think it is a wonderful time to stop. You are flooded with information uh, already. Uh, but Piero wants to have the last question. Question.
test, 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 test. Okay, no test, okay. Piero Petruccioli, USC, so again. Uh, just to avoid testing, we have been discussing on the need to go to some kind of formal uh, specifications of what we, we have to deal with, especially for the new, uh, for the new version of, of the system, for the so-called game changers, in particular for level three. And everybody is now looking to shift to rail. Uh, from some point of view, you can write shift to rail, you can read Messia. No, so shift rail is something that uh, should save <laughs> the European research, and this is uh, a positive thing. Uh, what I cannot un understand is what you are really doing within shift rail with the technical uh, demonstrator 2.7, in particular, that is uh, just on the form of methods, and has between uh, among the objectives I read uh, directly from the master plan to develop formal methods for requirement capture design, verification, and uh, validation. Very good. The only problem is this demonstrator will end in 2022, and we are now defining and, uh, and capturing requirements for all the game changers, level three, ATO, integration, and so on. Which kind of uh, support can we really expect from this uh, demonstrator, and which is the real activity that you are doing in shift array uh, in the form of methods. Thank you. Giorgio, I guess the question is for you. I hope it's not too detailed, uh, but uh, if you can answer that, uh, then we will do this as the last answer and then we will stop because Josef has to give you some other important information. Yeah, okay, so we'll be brief. We can then discuss uh, in bilateral, <laughs> but uh, just to answer to your a bit provocative question also in the same provocative manner, I don't know if I want to be or shift to rail want to be the messiah, but we are not. Uh, the, uh, the thing is that shift to rail uh, it's a research and innovation platform, like, uh, like you have said. Uh, so we have one advantage, we are discussing the future. And uh, so you cannot expect that a research initiative can solve all the problems of today. So what we need to build is to understand indeed what are the problems and to try to find the technical solutions to avoid. And one of these technical solutions is indeed the formal method that you have mentioned. And so this is an activity that is conducted in shift to rail which have started uh, uh, only since, uh, since a few months. So uh, the results are still, are still to come. And then we can discuss what exactly uh, each TD uh, activities are doing. Okay, thank you very much. This is uh, more or less the end of session number four. Uh, this was about telling you, coming from ERTMS at the moment being a mature system, uh, it has all the opportunities to develop the future railways. Uh, and, and of course we have to, to cover a couple of other uh, uh, issues uh, uh, to, to reach that. But <coughs> I hope that you can see that a lot of uh, stakeholders are not only thinking about the issues of the, the here and now ERTMS, but they really see that we are now at the point that we can use it to create the future. Thank you very much and give an, an, a, a last applause to the speakers. And while the picture is taken of the last panel, a great thank you also to Michel Rusen, as usually have done a fabulous moderation for a difficult session after lunch. Now, a very sad moment has come because yesterday morning I opened up this conference and I showed you this circle, the journey through the two days, and as predicted, the circle is closed now. We are coming to an end of a very interesting and in my view, again, very important conference. I am even tempted to say this has been another historic moment for ERTMS. And I would like to thank you all for coming here. We have had around 300 participants here in the Cité de Congrès in Valenciennes. 
but we have also had yesterday almost 700 people and today more than 300 people following us on the internet. So there is a huge interest in the topic of EHMS and we had many important elements that were discussed over the two days. Let me just come back to this morning. The key element of this morning has been the presentation of the action plan, the way forward for EHMS deployment. And I would like to pick up on some of the elements that were mentioned this afternoon by most of the speakers. It is about rail as a transport mode. It's about seeing rail from what is the benefit for the user. And it's about the challenges that rail as a transport mode is faced with. We heard this morning from Henry Kololai that market shares of rail are not developing very well. We heard that in the freight sector, market shares are going down. We heard that on the passenger side, the market share is also not developing very well. Now, we see that in other transport modes, there is a massive development, and the development is not only happening on a big financial scale, it is happening very fast. We see automation in automotive, and automation will shift the balance between the transport modes not in the favor of rail. So it is extremely important that we innovate in rail. It is extremely important that we create a single European rail area. It is important that we use the single European rail area to have the economy of scale in order to speed up innovation. And EATMS is a key element for creating this single European rail area. Now we have to move to action. We have an action plan. We have to move forward. We have to deliver. We see progress. And again, the key word in all of this has been mentioned many times today. It is called teamwork. We all need to work together because only together can we achieve the goal, making rail better for society. Now, I need to thank all of you for participating actively, but I need to thank in particular some people who have contributed to making this event a success. First, I would like to mention the steering committee for CCRCC 2017. And you have done a tremendous job in putting together an interesting agenda. Uh, what I'm always pleased in the CCRCC conference is when I look at you, the audience is still quite full. Other conferences after lunch, you have the speakers and perhaps the organizer and uh, two hostesses. But here we have still a full audience. That speaks for the quality of the program. Then, of course, I need to thank the A-team. I don't think, yes, there they are, Anita and Alexia. <laughs> then, behind the scenes, the communication team of the agency, Thorsten was here. Yeah, Thorsten. <laughs> then, Behind the scene, and now I tell you a little secret, for every successful conference you need somebody who masters the infrastructure. And we have the luck in the agency that we have Rula. And Rula, again, thank you very much for doing a marvelous job. <laughs> I already mentioned the live stream. 700 participants uh, is not as much as a speech by Obama, but uh, it's uh, quite significant. And uh, I would like to thank Begonia and Alain for managing the live stream. <laughs> now, I need to thank the organizers. And as every year, 
Begonia and Hans, Hans, Mr. CCRCC. <laughs> big, big <laughs> thank you. And all helpers behind the scenes from the EADMS units and other units in the agency. So, thank you all and now farewell. Farewell means that we shall meet again. I am tempted to talk to the conference center here in Varasien that they should reserve next year the big meeting or in two years next time the big room with 800 participants. So we will meet again in 2019. 2019 we will have 7,000 kilometers as we heard this morning. 2019 the agency will be authorizing entity. We wish you all a safe trip home and uh, please take with you all the input that engage you in actively working for the deployment of EMS. Thank you very much.